Welcome back to day two of uh, the Mars webinar. Uh, yesterday was a really a successful first day. We heard a lot of good talks about uh, um, imaging and diagnostics in terms of ruptured aortic aneurysms. We had a great faculty. We had a great uh, we had great chairman with Clark Siebrechts and Andrew Chong. And uh, now today on day two, we will focus on the open surgical treatment. So I just will give a short summary about things we learned or what I learned yesterday in, in, in this session and in the first uh, presentation we heard, we heard about the importance of um, duplex ultrasound as a screening tool that this really works, but that uh, in terms of national programs, there is uh, still um, in a lot of countries uh, that is missing. We heard from Andrew Chong from Singapore, we heard that uh, weather and also seasons will have an association in terms of uh, a rupturing of aortic aneurysms. And so here in the Northern Hemisphere, we have now winter. Uh, we will account um, a higher number of um, ruptured aneurysms than in summertime. So this means that in the Southern part, you will have a um, more relaxed time now. Uh, in a third talk from Moritz Wildgruber from Munich, we heard about the importance of uh, CT angiography in terms of assess assessment and measurement, and that uh, for the preoperative diagnostic and ruptured aortic aneurysms, um, ultrasound doesn't have a, a place uh, at the moment, that the CT scan is the gold standard. Benedikt Reutersberg here from Zurich uh, talked about the sizing in uh, ruptured aortic aneurysms and um, how to do it uh, in terms of um, assessing the CT angiography. And Soran could present some first data that uh, in this uh, in uh, these patients uh, with hypertonia that they will especially have an um, underestimation of the diameter in the iliac vessels for assessing the endovascular prosthesis. We heard from Lawrence Smoyley something about um, predictive models and uh, that these predictive models really work, but we discussed a lot about uh, can we really use them and in terms of ethical and moral considerations, we will hear today a talk about that. I'm really very excited about uh, this talk. Wilmer Schilling talked about um, posturative uh, imaging modalities and um, nowadays uh, there the CT scan in contrast to the preoperative um, um, imaging modality, the CT scan hasn't a role there. Most of uh, the postoperative imaging can now be done by contrast enhanced ultrasound. So we learned a lot today. Um, we will focus, as I said, on open surgical treatment. Um, I welcome you all. Um, I'm really happy to have you here. Please use the chat function. Um, and um, yeah, I'm looking forward to an exciting day. And I will give over now to the moderator of, of this day, Soren Rancic. Hello, everybody. Good afternoon, good morning, or good night. This spent, but not night that you're going to sleep because I, uh, we are in the different zones at the moment. I welcome you to Zurich. I welcome you to the University Hospital Zurich. And uh, today we are continuing our uh, Mars history. This today is the second day of the 10th uh, Mars course. And um, we are going today discuss about open surgical treatment. So not to waste the time. The point is ask the question, as I said yesterday, enjoy and participate hard. This is your meeting. This is your course. And through all the questions, all the faculty is here to answer you. We have two chairmen. One is a chairwoman. It's uh, Isabel uh, van Herzele, professor of uh, vascular surgery in the University of Ghent and uh, consultant on vascular surgery, surgery in the clinic for thoracic and vascular surgery. And uh, she started the, the MARTS with us 10 years ago. Welcome, Isabel. It's glad to have you on board. I'm really honored and pleasure to see you here. Thank you. Pleasure to be here, Zoran. Thank you. Okay. The second one should be the Christian Rips, professor of surgery from the Technical University in Dresden, but he's at the moment in the emergency operation. But it's my pleasure to introduce Benedict Reutersberg. He is a consultant of vascular surgery and he will join the Isabel to chair 
this uh, session, Open Surgical Treatment. Welcome, Benedict, to the course. Thanks, Zoran. It's a pleasure. So, we, according to our schedule, we will start with the first presentation. Uh, for those who were not yesterday here, who was not yesterday here, just to tell how it will work, we have pre-recorded sessions. So after that sessions, you have a chance to ask the questions. Send the more questions through the chat so that we can read and then answer on your questions. So the first question, the first talk pre-recording is going to be by Isabel with the topic, what is the evidence in rupture aortic aneurysm? So please, I'm happy to see the talk. I would like to thank the Zurich group and especially Zoran Rancic for inviting me to be part of the 10th Mars course focusing on the management of rupture AAA. The data I will be presenting is largely based on randomized controlled trials. Four randomized trials have compared open and endovascular repair in rupture AAA. Two were carried out in the United Kingdom with the intention to treat patients by endovascular means and randomization took place before CTA while in the Netherlands and France, randomization took place after CTA to ensure the anatomical suitability for either intervention. The oldest single center randomized controlled trial was published in 2006 and selected patients with a suspicion of rupture AAA. Only 31% were randomized. Some died prior to the CTA or arrival in the OR. Those who did make it were treated. One EVAR needed to be converted to open repair due to technical issues um, and the 30-day mortality rates were about 50%. In all endovascular cases, an orthoaliac uh, configuration was used. The ECAR trial carried out in France randomized patients per week, but only after the CTA had been taken to ensure the feasibility of EVAR. Centers experience were limited and patients were mainly hemodynamically stable. Only 21% of the ruptured cases were randomized. In 16.8% an ortic occlusion balloon was needed to stabilize the patient. 30-day mortality rates between endo and open surgery was similar but very good. The IX trial carried out in the Netherlands also randomized patients after CTA who were relatively stable. The 30-day mortality rates here were also excellent. Anatomical criteria for EVAR were strictly defined, but most importantly, all the paramedics and the accident emergency staff were trained to use permissive hypotension when they encountered a patient with a suspicion of rupture AAA. Only 22% of the rupture AAA patients were randomized, but the results were outstanding with low 30-day mortality rates as shown on the previous slide. In the EVAR group, two patients died prior to repair, eight were converted to open surgery, and one died during the intervention. In the open group, three were misdiagnosed, and four died during the intervention. The excellent results may be related to centralization, mandatory CTA, and logistics. The last trial is the IMPROVE trial carried out in the UK, who randomized patients in the accident emergency department when a rupture AAA was suspected. Based on the intention to treat analysis, 30-day mortality rates were similar in both groups. However, let's have a look at the trial in detail. 48% were randomized based on suspicion of rupture AAA and allocated to endo or open repair. Another diagnosis was present in 9%, symptomatic AAA in 4%, and crossover occurred a lot from the EVAR group to open surgery because of personnel reasons, rapid deterioration, unsuitable anatomy, from the open to the endo group because patients were seen to be too fragile, clinical decision making, unfit for general anesthesia. The overall mortality rate, if we look not on the intention to treat basis, but what type of treatment patients had is 25% for EVAR and 37% for open repair. Is it surprising that a clinical diagnosis of rupture de is difficult to make? No, it's not. 
based on this cohort study, the triad of abdominal or back pain, hypotension and a palpable mass is only 21%. In the next two slides, I've summarized the data of the four trials, allowing you to compare them and to see the differences. It's obvious that less than half of the rupture AAA were randomized. Crossover happened especially in those trials where patients were randomized before the CTA had been taken. 30-day mortality rates have improved over time and were especially low in those trials where patients were hemodynamically stable. Especially in the UK, patients were not offered any treatment in several cases, and the anatomical criteria were the main reason for exclusion in the IX trial in the Netherlands. Patients treated under local anesthesia have a lower mortality in the improved trial, 13% versus 34%. And in the IX and improved trial, several conversions to general anesthesia were needed because of an orthouniliac stent graft configuration that had been used inducing limp ischemia. The definition of hemodynamic instability is not standardized and the aortic occlusion balloon was used both in the IX and the ECAR trial, although they mainly included hemodynamically stable patients. Abdominal compartment syndrome does occur after both endo and open repair, but was seldom diagnosed in the improved trial, although more unstable patients were treated, which is surprising. So the difference in perioperative mortality in favor of EVAR was not confirmed in the intention to treat analysis, but it was if it's based on the intervention received analysis, which was recently published in the European Journal of Vascular and Endovascular Surgery. Also in the registries, EVAR did better than open surgery, but selection bias is almost certain in these studies. Nevertheless, the authors concluded, including Janet Powell and Frank Feed, that if EVAR can be done, it's a better treatment for rupture AAA than open repair, as it carries a lower perioperative mortality risk. Especially older patients, female patients, and sicker patients benefit more from endovascular repair compared to open repair. Patients who are admitted with a low blood pressure, below 70 systolic, are more likely to die. The anatomical suitability for EVAR varies per center. We do push the limits, do have to be prudent in hostile anatomy, 30-day mortality rates, especially with a short neck length, are very high. Patients who are treated by endovascular means go home quicker than after open repair, which is important for the quality of life of these patients. And keep in mind that numerous reinterventions are needed within 90 days of randomization, but also between three months and three years, as shown on these slides. And the number of reinterventions at midterm are almost double after elective EVAR than after open repair, suggesting that strict surveillance protocols are crucial. Even beyond three years, reinterventions are still needed. And keep in mind that after open surgery, major amputations are more likely to be needed than after endovascular repair, and this is considered as a worse reintervention by patients. So based on the provided evidence, ESVS, NICE, SVS and German guidelines have decided and recommended that patients with a ruptured infrarenal AAA should be treated by endovascular means if anatomically feasible, ideally under local anesthesia. Thank you, Isabel. Very, very interesting talk. I think there's already a lot of discussion going on in the chat room. Um, uh, one, one interesting thing is, uh, what do you think if we would run another trial today? So it's, it's almost 10 years ago uh, since improved trial and, uh, and things moved forward. We gain a lot of experience with EVAR. A lot of um, um, physicians uh, or surgeons can do EVAR today much better than they maybe could do that uh, years earlier. So do you think that the um, outcome would be better today and uh, EVA would actually be um, ha have a better outcome than open repair at all? 
I think it will mainly uh, be influenced by the fact if you're going to include everybody with a suspicion of rupture AAA, because then you will still end up in the improved trial that you will have some misdiagnosis. The technique has definitely improved and also the devices. So I think we're better at sizing uh, because we're all using dedicated workstations. We work in teams, but I think it should be stressed that not only the technique is important, but also how the patient is being admitted that we respect permissive hypertension that we actually watch abdominal compartment syndrome and follow them up strictly. Um, and I think those are probably the, the problems and maybe the limitations of some of the randomized controlled trials because there was not always a standard operating protocol uh, as you have in Zurich and as a lot of people have around the world with excellent results. And I think that's something that may be lacking. So I think another randomized controlled trial, personally, I would not be... Uh, I think happy to randomize my patients to it because if I know I have somebody who is suitable for endovascular repair, I think it would have it would be difficult for me to randomize them to open surgery. I think it's different if you have cases where the anatomy is uh, not ideal, and if you don't have the opportunity to offer physician modified stand graft, or if you don't have uh, certain devices on the shelf. I think I totally agree. I think that was a very good um, summary. So is there any further questions, Zoran? I don't uh, have my video, but uh, <laughs> I just want we to... We hear you. I, okay, then it's fine. I'm thinking maybe the new... I completely agree with Isabel that there is no the place for new randomized trials because always was the question why we needed these trials. But nowadays, maybe we should think to use some adjuncts, to, for example, with uh, surgical modified stand graphs or the parallel graphs or something that we can extend the proximal landing zone. The biggest problem was that a lot of people who work in the improved trial move for endovascular to open surgery because of a hostile neck. Mm -hmm. And that means in this situation that can be maybe used. On the, for example, to these trials with uh, stable patients, we don't need to use the stable patient because for instable patients, the adjuncts are helping as a aortic uh, occlusion balloon. Um, no more questions? So without slide, I think, uh, thank you, Isabel. Thank you very much. So we will continue. And we have uh, Tanya Krones, professor of uh, ethics at the University of Zurich and the lead in um, clinical ethics. So Tanya, the story you are going to tell us is completely new for us because you're giving us the answers that we had to do it by ourselves, but now we are giving you the talk. So the pre-recorded case or the pre-recorded talk, and then we have chance to ask uh, Professor Krones. Thank you very much to be with us today. Thank you very much for inviting me to give a talk on ethical considerations in the treatment of ruptured aortic aneurysm. So, the agenda is that I will first give a very short refresher on clinical ethics in a nutshell, then discuss decision-making in elective surgeries, what are today's no-goes, basics, and best practice, and then come to the um, topic of the conference respecting patients' preferences in an emergency surgical intervention such as ruptured aneurysm. So if you want to quickly say one in one sentence, what is the history of not only medical, but also medical ethics and especially of treatment choices, we can say that it is from paternalism, the doctor knows best, to medical professionalism, which means also a goals of care and a shared decision-making approach with our patients. And to honor patients' preferences in elective surgery, in this example, what can we say about that? Um, we can get 100% consent to aortic aneurysm elective surgery if this was one in very great study of Bert Mollewijk and other colleagues from the Netherlands over 20 years ago, if surgeons use the word time bomb, you have a time bomb in your belly, then every patient gets the operation and says, I want the time bomb out. But this is of course not fair and not right, right? So what is the minimum today? The minimum, if we have an aneurysm and we, 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 have it, we saw it in screening, the minimum is check our operability and obtain a valid informed consent. So surgery is the default. 
This is the typical thinking. And if surgery is not indicated, we have two other options, do really nothing and let the patient just live her life or the wait and see and screening strategy. But if you look at the evidence base and possible choices, you have, of course, always all options. You can see here, you have surgery, you have wait and see and do nothing. And in, if you look at the future, if you chose surgery or wait and see, you have at the end, a natural death or a surgical death, or if you decide not to get up the operation, you have a death by rupture. So this is the whole um, decision tree. And if you really want to do shared decision making, you, you help the patient by understanding what that means, also by giving numbers in a way that people understand it. So you have a new presentation. If you really want to have honor patient's preferences from the beginning and do a real shared decision-making approach, you have surgery, wait and see and do nothing. And you present the, um, the outcomes in these ways, like for decision aids. And um, there are a lot of decision aids, evidence-based decision aids around. You can look them up, for example, if you go to the Ottawa Health Research Decision Aid um, Inventory. Um, there are randomized trials on that. And we know that if patients get decision aids instead of informed consent or um, surgery, you should get operation or not, people are much more informed. There are less, there's less anxiety or the equal way of anxiety and they choose this way in a very good manner and have the feeling that they are well informed and get their way. Um, well, you can say, well, this is a, an excellent solution. They might not fit to the problem, especially from, sorry, especially from the problem of what to do in emergency situations, how to honor patient preferences in an emergency, such as aneurysm rupture. First thing you can say is, come on, it's an emergency. We, can talk to, we can't talk to the patient. And as physicians, we always have to save lives, right? Is this true? Well, if you look at that, it's not that true, right? We have um, also, we have to have a fair evaluation. Also for this situation, we have lack of evidence. We have controversies in which way to go, right? And it is always an emergency situation. It's also a thing to have a good choice. And a good choice means also to honor preferences. And well, the first thing is that we switch from an uh, intervention approach to a goals of care approach. There are four goals in medicine and they're equally important. It's not the prevention of death, but the prevention of premature death as one goal. The other is prevention of disease. The next one is care of the ill and the next of, is relief of suffering. And it's always also about increasing quality of life and quality of death. So the word death rate is 100%, we all die. The question is also how we die, right? And in emergency situations, of course, we can use ethical principles. Also, if we have not very much time, an excellent article by Isason and a very nice um, standard operating procedure. You ask yourself, is this a type of situation where there is a rule that you can follow? If you don't have a rule, and I will present the rule, then you can think of how to buy more time, especially for finding out what the patient would want and what the premiosis is. And if you don't have it, you have three tests. I won't go into it, but you can read that up in this article. So the rule is that we first have to think what types of patients have a ruptured aneurysm and what, do, what duties do we have? So we have patients with a known aortic aneurysm and they who decided for a wait and see or no intervention strategy due to a former shared decision making process. And we have patients with a spontaneously ruptured aneurysm. And in some of these patients, we have known goals of care, also in emergency situations due to advanced care planning, or a surrogate decision maker who, who knows the preferences, which is there and available. And we have or we have no information about preferred goals of care. And we have patients in this both types with or without a reasonable short and midterm survival option. And to go through it, patients with a known aortic aneurysm and a wait and see no intervention strategy, he has decided upon this way. It is important not to only offer shared decision-making, but also advanced care planning. The plan B, what happens if the aneurysm will rupture or you have another emergency. Advanced care planning is a scientific um, concept to plan ahead to do advanced directives, sensitive, um, sensible and sensitive advanced directives. There's a huge scientific evidence on that, programs that are evidence-based, and the plans you make are, for example, physician order for life-sustaining treatment. And if you have done that, there's a quality process behind this advanced care planning, you should follow the plan also in the emergency of a ruptured aneurysm, depending on the goal of care. Then second part, uh, second category, patients with a spontaneously ruptured aneurysm, 
who is still capable of decision making or a surrogate gate decision maker who is available, then we should do serious owners conversation. This is an excellent also evidence based conversation skill um, um, also um, investigated and implemented by Arturo Gavande, who is known for the checklist manifesto, but also for his wonderful book, Being Mortal. And you can read that up in this article in Annals of Surgery, how to have a good communication to facilitate goals of care for seriously ill older patients, also with emergency surgical conditions. And in patients with unknown preferences and no clearly bad short-term prognosis, of course, it's important to give it a trial, but of course, to re-evaluate the goals of care together, mostly with the surrogate decision makers after surgery and see what is the prognosis and what is the preferred goals of care after the surgery, also depending on the complications after surgery. And in clearly frail patients with a bad short and medium-term prognosis, don't be a bit messenger. It's important to convey this message in a good way. Read that article. It's a wonderful article of Mera in the BMJ um, several years ago. There are several ways of not good conveying the message. And if you read it, you know why the chameleon way of ba um, bad um, news conveyance is a very, very good way. And um, you should do it in a highly skilled way. And of course, not only that, but apply palliative care in the best way possible and search for help if you don't know how. Um, it's not only about giving morphine. Ask your palliative care physician and do a very, very good advanced care planning all the time. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Kroens. That was an excellent talk, actually. I really enjoyed that. Um, if I may, because um, I see that there are some questions. Um, it's often indeed that there's an advanced care planning in elective situations, but sometimes the patients, when they actually are faced with a rupture and they come to your accident emergency department, they actually do change their mind because they are afraid of what's going to be happening to them. So how should we deal with that as a surgeon and mm -hmm. as a human being? Yes. It's a very important question. Huh? So advanced care planning is always, of course, a process. And it's not like a testament saying, if, if you say something, you, you stick to that. So we are, we are human beings. And of course, we can change our minds. But the evidence is really very, very strong that if you do advanced care planning in a very, very good way, in a deep way, and really elicit goals of care, patient, and you, you also have a treatment plan of palliation in, 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 in place, then patients normally don't change their minds so, so quickly. So I had one situation just to share it with you. There was one situation where the patient with an advanced care plan, right? And uh, saying he doesn't want to go to the ICU any, any time with the COPD. And the physician came onto the ward and he had one, one paper and saying, um, do you want to die? He had a black cross on, his, um, on this paper. You want to die? The patient said, oh, well, no. And then he crossed it. So the ICU, right? So there was only intubation and have stick to the dyspnea or dying. And the palliative approach of uh, terminal sedation, which most physicians choose in this situation, was not offered to the patient. So it's also a question of what we offer instead of emergency surgery. When we say we can keep you in comfort, um, there is a way really of, of you know, helping you. This one, we should say, it, 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 if you say you, you die or you, you will be operated, then you get, of course, the answer. It's like the time bomb then. I see there's some questions. How do you get trained to deal with the serious pathology and how do you actually learn how to go to this advanced care planning? Do you have any uh, tips? Oh, thanks so much for this question. Yes, there is really a, a lot of programs around the world. If you look it up, for example, in, in, the, uh, in the US, it's the Respecting Choices Program. In Australia, it's the Respecting Patient Choices Program. At the University Hospital in Zurich, we have a one-day course where we teach the Serious Illness Conversation Guide. And it's there also the Ariadna Labs in, 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 at the University of Harvard, where they develop the Serious Illness Conversation Guide. So they're really training tools, very, very convenient training tools, uh, where you can, which you can look up. When you, when you go to these links, which I gave you, you will find them actually around the world. But I think that's really an important issue, which we should already learn in med school and uh, should, this will, should be implanted uh, in the early clinical years uh, for, for everybody. And um, I, I really appreciated the talk. Thank you very much. Can I ask you something? Of course. Um, the big problem... Uh, 
in the emergency room is the time pressure. Mm -hmm. And if we cannot buy time mm -hmm. uh, to, to, for decision making, it's a difficult situation. If we buy time and, we, uh, and the patient takes the risk and he has a higher risk in the meantime, then it's his decision. But if, if we are on a high time pressure, mm -hmm. what, what would you advise to, mm -hmm. to deal with this? Well, this is really excellent, an excellent question and, uh, and a very important answer to be given. So um, to tell you, to give an, give an example, if you really have highly skilled communication skills, it's on, not only medical school, but it's really a long-term learning. And um, what Arthur Wanda has developed this, this the Serious Illness Conversation Guide is really for the emergency room. And I can um, tell you what kind of question, just, just um, tell you what kind of questions you could ask. Also in a very, very short time, you can say, is there, is, is there any kind of care um, if, you, if you are really sick, what you would want or you wouldn't want, right? So is there any treatment intolerable to, uh, intolerable to you? You can say that. And I can tell you that if you really ask that question and not do you want resuscitation, but from the person's, person's perspective saying this, right? Um, um, is there any kind of care that you would or wouldn't want me as your surgeon to do? There are patients who, who tell you the worst thing I wouldn't want is to die on the ICU, for example. And if your parents think, said, see, I hope that this won't happen, but I, I, I am afraid that this might happen also if we do the, do the, do the operation, right? And um, this is, these are really specific questions. If you look it up in the article, which, which are developed for really short-term eliciting goals of care. And they work, they are tested, so... So, and it's so really for, about, it's like really being great. Mm -hmm. For yes. this, you need a, a quiet or a calm environment. And in the emergency room, there are 10 people, everybody's trying to put a line or a tube into the patient. So you have to need, you need time, maybe mm -hmm. one, two minutes to discuss with the patient alone. Which is true, but um, I mean, you are you are experienced surgeon. My 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 husband is also an experienced emergency uh, care physician. He says if you are experienced, if you you don't need even two minutes, you need at you need at least four questions and give the patient a, a one minute one minute talk. Say just be quiet for a minute and ask this question. You will get an answer. And I think it is as important as putting the line. And if you are the the ones in charge, you should try to find that very very short time for really placing the, putting, yeah, putting the questions, if, if possible. Sorry, uh, I raised the hand. It was really great talk. It was really, I don't know, it's amazing. And we asked a lot of people, a lot of people asked they would like to share the articles if there are some articles that you can share. And uh, what I would ask you very short, and I know that it is not maybe, I don't know how to answer because I'm completely confused with this. We are living in a COVID time. And in the COVID time, we have a health capacity resources. And I know that the vascular surgeon in the uh, United States, Society of Vascular Surgeon, discussed that they should not operate the cases with rupture AAA if the procedure should be by open surgery. How can we do that ethically or morally? That means we have one pandemic and we have something very local. It's, it's about a patient. That's a tricky question to be answered. I know it's so complicated. Maybe no, 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 it is. I, what I can say is, you know, you know, this triage that you, you, you're talking, um, Soren, you, you, you're hinting to the triage and injustice problem, right? And the, the problem is that this is one of the hardest decisions we can make. And I can just tell you that everybody is fighting for his or her patient. Right? Yeah. This is normal. This is any physician will do that. But the problem is, of course, if we have scarce resources, and this is now we always have scarce resources, but in these times we see it before our eyes, right? And if you have a patient, I mean, I saw these numbers of these excellent trials, still a lot of patients die. I saw these figures about 30% death. And if you have a lot of patients and only five ICU beds, let's say, of course you have to think of giving the bed to those. Who have a greater chance of survival because this is the problem see so this is really coming together and we all try to avoid this hard triage but what is happening if we're not transparent we do what we say is a silent triage implicit wrestling so everybody is fighting for his patient and another patient will die because we don't have the resources see? i don't want to press I you know, at all <laughs> I, know, I know 
<laughs> thank you very much for this great answer. I think I pick up the essence of this. Thank you very much. Okay. So thank you. Thanks. Uh, we will continue. So uh, which factors do influence the results of open pair? Our senior consultant, Dr. Reinhard Kopp, is going to give pre-recorded case and then we're going to ask him, please Reinhard or please Tina start pre-recorded case, please. Dear members of the organizing committee, dear chairman, thank you for the invitation. And I also want to welcome all participants attending this exceptional meeting. The topic of my presentation was already mentioned, which factors influence the results of open repair for ruptured abdominal aortic aneurysms. When we look on the results of the randomized controlled trials and large observational studies, 30-day mortality for open aortic repair for ruptured triple A is between 24 and 53 percent. There seems to be an early benefit for EVA after ruptured triple A repair, but this survival benefit was seen only in the observational studies and not in the randomized trials. So which factors influence the results of open repair? Going back to the times before endovascular therapy, this early study from Australia from 1996, investigating 154 patients with a palpative mortality of 39% has shown that the outcome was related to advanced age, hemodynamic instability and comorbidities. According to their results, the authors conclude that a selection of patients to be treated and a more optimized distribution of healthcare resources should be considered. Have you improved over time? This more recent study from Belgrade with a title Clearly Confident About Open Aortic Repair has investigated 729 patients with the ruptured AAA during two 10 years time periods. Post operative mortality markedly decreased over time from initially 40% to 25%, and several factors related to outcome, including shock organ failure, the camping site use, and bleeding complications. The authors recommended immediate surgery, supracedial clamping, the use of cell saver for retransfusion, and treatment by high-volume surgeons in high-volume centers. Age is considered to be a risk factor for patients having open rupture triple A repair. As shown in this meta-analysis from the Netherlands 2020, investigating patients with rupture triple A being 80 years or older, preoperative mortality was 43% with a clear benefit for EVA. However, the study from Bern on the right side has shown that open rupture AAA repairs feasibly in selected octogenarians with a preoperative mortality of 27% and good postoperative outcome. Also, the ESVS guidelines recommend that selection of patients should not be based on scoring systems or on advanced age alone. Postoperative complications like colon ischemia and abdominal compartment syndrome are known to influence outcome after open aortic repair for rupture AAA. IMA reimplantation during open rupture AAA operations should be considered in patients with poor IMA back bleeding, occlusion of one or both hypergastric arteries, previous right colon resection, intraoperative pale sigmoid colon presentation, and known SMA stenosis or occlusion. For prevention of abdominal compartment syndrome after open rupture AAA repair, a liberal use of prophylactic open abdomen treatment with an early second look. Regular measurements of abdominal compartment pressure and flexible sigmoidoscopy according to clinical evaluation is recommended. These are the data of after open aortic repair for rupture AAA from the Zurich Hospital. 104 patients treated between 1997 and 2002. 30-day mortality was 31% and factors associated with 30-day and 90-day mortality were rupture, preoperative shock, cardiopulmonary resuscitation, massive blood transfusion and abdominal compartment syndrome. With a focus on EVA for rupture AAA repair, the overall mortality in our hospital is now less than 20% with a higher 30-day mortality after open aortic repair compared to EVA. Anatomy um, of the aortic neck and the aortic neck length are critical points as shown in this study based on the improved trial. In patients with rupture triple A's having a short inferior neck between 0 and 4 mm 30 day mortality was 45% and significantly, significantly higher in the open aortic repair group and lower in patients with a so-called more friendly aortic neck longer than 16 mm. Therefore, negative selection of challenging patients with very short inferior neck considered unsuitable for EVA into the open aortic repair group might probably explain the better outcome described for EVA in rupture AAA patients as reported from the observational studies. Hospital 
factors in surgeon's volume are additional factors considered to affect outcome after rupture triple A repair. As shown in this study based on the German DRG registry data, mortality after auto repair for rupture triple A was significantly lower in high volume hospitals, more than 30 triple A cases per year, in comparison to smaller hospitals both after EVA or after open aortic repair. What's about reinterventions? Most um, reinterventions uh, after open rupture triple A repair according to the data from the improved trial were observed within 19 days and related to abdominal complications, re-bleeding, limp ischemia and longer ventilation, overall with no difference compared to EVA so far, although some late um, life-threatening complications after EVA were mentioned as a footnote. Based on the ESVS recommendations, long-term complications after open aortic repair for rupture AAA after 5 and 10 to 15 years were paraanastomotic aneurysms in up to 12%, limb occlusion 5%, incisional hernias up to 20%, graft infections 5% and autoenteric fistulas in 1%. The most recent NICE and ESVS guidelines for rupture AAA repair have considered open aortic repair as an at least equivalent treatment option for infrarenal rupture AAA repair, especially for younger patients and those requiring more complex um, intervention. So, in conclusion, as shown here, there are several factors that will influence outcome after aortic repair for rupture AAA related to patient, uh, to aortic anatomy, to hemodynamic instability, this will be the topic of the next presentation, risk of complications and vascular team experience. Consideration of these factors will help to find a more individualized strategy for rupture triple A repair by either EVA or open aortic repair. Candidates for open aortic repair will include younger patients, those with long life expectancy or considered unsuitable for EVA, and those with infection, fistula, or caused by connective tissue disorders. Finally, it will be mandatory for the vascular teams and vascular surgeons to further improve both techniques, EVA and open aortic repair, to be prepared for patients presenting with more complex aortic pathologies and to improve overall outcome. Well, these are my remarks concerning this uh, topic. Thank you for your attention. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think there were already some questions in the uh, chat room. I think one was from you, Isabel. Uh, I don't think that everybody saw that one. Um, maybe. Yeah, so um, Brian, I thank you very much for this nice overview. I think uh, we all know that endovascular treatment is becoming increasingly popular, and especially the younger people are getting more and more difficulties to learn these open skills. So how should we actually still learn them and maintain them because they're still occasionally needed? Uh, so how do you think we should do that? And my second part was, or should we just do open surgery in centers of excellence? What is your view on that? Well, that's, uh, I think, a, a big point. And I think the discussion is already going on in, in this field. And the data show that uh, the outcome is better in centers with, a, let's say, a higher volume or more experienced uh, um, surgeons and, um, and, and in a more experience uh, hospital and especially this point is uh, relevant in the open aortic repair group in the EVA group um, well according to the studies um, the volume of uh, for surgeon and hospital is more stable and doesn't show this uh, this uh, higher mortality in, in the smaller hospitals um, and uh, because of the increasing numbers of EVA going on the, the numbers of open repair will decrease and that's the, the second point that by this, it's difficult to, to teach and, and train um, the, the younger uh, endovascular surgeons. And I think well, the, the society and all the national um, groups have uh, tried to, to focus on this point, to include uh, um, workshops, to include model um, uh, preparations and to uh, and the next point will, will be, should we concentrate this in, in centers? And, and there was uh, just a recent um, debate in the ESVS journal from the editors. And then they, I think the headline was, uh, we, we already have the facts and we cannot ignore these facts. So this is a, a point to, to well, for the, for the big centers, I think they would agree with this, and, but not every center will, 
will um, agree with this point. So how is it organized in Zurich? Do you have then a team on call to do the endo and a team on call to do the open or can you do both? Well, because that's, that's a, another challenge. That's a good point. And then we will see uh, in which direction it will go in, in the future. At the moment, uh, we try to uh, be uh, trained in, in both. But um, uh, at, at, in the next years, so I think there will be uh, more specialization of uh, some doing EVA and, 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 and advanced EVA, and the others will go for open uh, um, uh, repair, especially including this, uh, these complex uh, cases and the, the connective tissue disorders. I see there's a question from our audience as well. Somebody says, okay, you have a ruptured AAA in a small hospital, patient is too unstable to move, and it's not possible to do an EVA, so what you should do? then you do have to do it. Maybe using an endoclamp, or how would you advise them to deal with these? Yeah, for the for the unstable cases, I think Soren will, will show this afterwards, the the um, uh, balloon occlusion and, and the um, Reboa procedure is, is an option. And uh, however, we have to, to uh, be aware that, that we go in, in the strategy, we go for EVA. We, we select the good cases for EVA and, and, and some of these cases are then left uh, even if they have comorbidities, but they're unsuitable for EVA. So some of them then go to open repair and uh, it's already based on the strategy that we have a good outcome in the strategy first group and probably a, a worse outcome in the other. I think it would also be fair to go, or we should select, look for, for more patients being good candidates for open repair, to look, uh, to take them out, especially if we consider the long-term outcome. And in our uh, approach we are doing now is based on the idea that EVA gives better short-term out, uh, short outcome, but we don't really know it for the long-term. And this we should keep in mind and find out the good candidates, the young people, those uh, with a long life expectancy uh, to offer them at least also open repair. There's another question uh, from uh, the audience. Um, is there a role for endo occlusion? So I think it's uh, a rebore if one has committed to open repair. Um, Yes, of, of I think that's what uh, will be the, the, the presentation about hemodynamic instability. If you have an unstable patient uh, and probably, uh, um, well, you have to stabilize him first and then this will be an endoclamping uh, and then uh, you, you can go uh, and decide which would be the best option, either EVA or open repair. Okay, thank you very much. I think uh, Zoran is uh, urging us to move on. I think we will put the rest of the questions in the chat. So Reinhardt, if that's okay with you, would you be so kind to answer these to the people so they can actually uh, know what to do in the future? Uh, okay. Zor, it's now my pleasure actually to introduce Zoran Ranchik, who I've met indeed at one of these Mars courses, who is a very dynamic person when he's giving these uh, hands-on training sessions. So I'm really looking forward to his lecture uh, in this virtual Mars course. Zoran, the floor is yours, and it's all about therapy strategies, uh, resuscitative endovascular balloon occlusion of the aorta and rupture AAA. Thank you. Good afternoon once again. This is a story about use of aortic resuscitative endovascular balloon occlusion in patients with rupture AAA. The synonyms are endoclamping or simply aortic balloon occlusion. Those are lessons we learned from 22 years experience in the University Hospital Zurich. Nothing to disclose. There is always a history First emergent EVA for rupture AAA was done in 1994 by Frank Wyth. Here in Zurich, we did first emergent EVA for rupture in 1998. There was a period, 2010 to 13, when we performed only EVA for rupture AAA. Patient pathway is standardized. Every patient with suspected rupture becomes CT angio to make diagnosis and prove feasibility for emergent EVA. In the shock room, 
follows anesthetic workup on the one side and surgical decision open of endovascular treatment is going to follow on the other side. At the end of the procedure, patients getting CT angio and then transfer to ICU. We define five key elements that influence the results of treatment. Hemodynamic, imaging, procedure, abdominal compartment syndrome, and team. I will focus on hemodynamic. After call, we advise referee to lower blood pressure, red square, in every patient with suspected aortic acute lesion. There are two measures that belong to hypotensive hemostasis, permissive hypovolemia, no or little infusion, and control hypotension. In patients with normal or high pressure, blood pressure is actively lower pharmacologically. Whenever possible, we use local anesthesia. In case of hemodynamic crash, we use aortic balloon occlusion. This is something that is not new. Indeed, in 1953 was first published the use of balloon for hemodynamic massive abdominal bleeding in stable patient. In 1977, use Fogarty catheter was described in patients with ruptured AAA. 2002, in European Journal of Vascular Endovascular Surgery, we published use of endoclamping and local anesthesia for ruptured AAA. And here we see the immediate effect of balloon inflation in increase of blood pressure from the systolic 35 to 85 already after three minutes. The aortic occlusion balloon can be also used in open surgery. That means beside open cross clamping on aorta, we can use aortic balloon occlusion through the rupture site, transfemoral or transaxillar. The technique and what we need. It's not about only one balloon. In fact, there are two balloons. And I will now show you how to play with these balloons on the simulation and in real case. What we need for balloon aortic occlusion is the stiff wire, long 12 or 20 French sheet and compliant aortic occlusion balloon. We are making access transfemoral and through the 12 French sheet over the stiff wire, we introduce an inflate compliant balloon in aorta zone two. Let's call this balloon first balloon. To implant a stand graft main body from contralateralized side, we need a wire. In order to pass the wire, we need to deflate shortly first balloon. After passing the balloon, we inflate first balloon fast. Before deploying stand graft, we perform angiography through the sheet with inflated first balloon. This is on simulator and the real patient. Second run with deployed main body of stand graft. Main body of stand graft is deployed. Another occlusion balloon is inflated within the main body. Let's call this one second balloon. In this moment, we have two inflated balloons. First in our zone two and the second in main body. Now we have to remove first balloon. Second balloon is inflated. First balloon is deflated. In open surgery, that will be removal of supracilia clamp and outer close clamp in infra or transrenal. Second balloon is inflated. First balloon is removed. Real patient in geography. Ever is almost finished. We have to deploy the contralateral limb of stand graft in order to pass the wire for contralateral limb, we need to deflate shortly second balloon, then a gate inflated fast, and completely deploy the contralateral limb. What we have to be aware if we want to use aortic occlusion balloon? The killer is access. So the transfemoral access, we try to make it percutaneously, but if it does not work, we go for open reopen access. Don't lose the time. Always puncture two centimeters above the femoral bifurcation. They are same modality from punctury axillary artery. 
for brachial arteries preferred open surgical access. Second issues to be aware, check descending arta to identify shaggy arta and prevent embolization. Third, be aware that aortic occlusion balloon can cause complication. Embolization, aortic rupture, dissection, balloon rupture can be dislocated or can cause ischemia reperfusion injury. Fourth, aortic balloon occlusion must be learned on a 3D flow model or on the virtual reality module. Fifth, the use of aortic occlusion balloon is teamwork and could be trained in simulation room. You see two faculties who are doing this. Everyone has to feel confident what the old team is doing. And that will result in appropriate reactions when storm, winter or rupture is coming. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, uh, Zoran, for a very interesting uh, talk. So um, there are a couple of uh, questions already, but first, um, there are um, already emergency um, vehicles um, equipped with uh, rebore systems and there are um, emergency staff already doing rebore um, procedures without fluoroscopy um, outside of the hospital. And uh, what do you think about uh, this uh, trend? Uh, there is a different uh, trends how to do this. In Japan, they put just a sheet into five French sheet in the femoral artery and using that uh, for a measurement of arterial pressure. And in case that they need, they put then the reboa. Uh, the system must be defined for everyone doing reboa. What we are doing here in the, uh, our shock room, we are doing that, that we are using, and I'm going to answer to the question about fluoroscopy, yes or no. We try to put that with our fluoroscopy, that to, but put a balloon could be very dangerous. So that means we are doing in a shock room and our shock room has facilities, we have C-arm, so we can make a fluoroscopy and see how it works. Also, we have a kit and this kit is uh, within the shock room. So that means when the patient's coming, deteriorate, we can uh, just take this kit and it's very, let's say straightforward, we define the, how to use this. So that means we are trying to do that always with, um, with uh, fluoroscopy. I think, Soren, there were some more questions. One is what type of balloon are you using? And have you ever experienced a rupture of the aorta when you are using one of these balloons? I we didn't have the rupture, but we have a dissection, and I, I have uh, we had uh, dissections. Then uh, we had also almost all complications. What I mentioned this, and then the second is we're using Reliant balloon, the Reliant balloon twelve French sheet. But there is also Coda balloon, and there is also on the market some other Tokai, for example, or some uh, from America which does not need any wire. So that means they are different. There is also the Pruitt in Ahara, or so different, but let's say uh, use what you are familiar with. We, at the moment, we are using this 12 French long sheet and uh, compliant balloon. And another question was, what do you think about um, uh, Rebois in open surgery, um, yeah. I think? So yeah. you had just the experience two days ago, so maybe I want to say that was tell a... something about that. A very specific, Zoran, they are asking in the percentage of cases in open surgery, how often would you use it? Because it's a center that's thinking of maybe starting to do that. Okay, let's say what the numbers I know. I know that we use the 70% um, in total of all patients reboa. That means the patient have to hemodynamical deteriorate, then we are putting a balloon. Then let's say um, we have the kit and in open surgery, what is interesting, we used two days ago from the brachial artery, we put a balloon, a patient with a six centimeter big aneurysm with Lerich completely 
occluded the six centimeter aneurysm and the rupture was two centimeters be below the renal arteries. The patient did not have a, did not have a neck and had additional thrombe in the superior mesenteric artery and celiac trunk. What we did from the above, from the brachial artery, we put a balloon, we inflated the balloon, and then we made the, we opened the aorta, removing the plaque. So that means also remove the thrombe. But what is interesting, that the point with use of balloon is communication with anesthesiology. So that means inflating, deflating, inflating, deflating might, might be something uh, uh, complicated, but uh, let's say, I think it's enough from Reboa. You should come to the hands-on Reboa and then we will talk, so, uh, let's move on. Good, yeah, thank you, uh, Zoran. I um, have to introduce uh, Professor Christian Rapes, uh, one of my my former teachers, but who is unfortunately, uh, actually w w um, I stepped in to be uh, the chair for him instead because he had to go to an emergency uh, case in his uh, hospital in in um, Dresden. And, uh, but uh, we have his uh, pre-recorded video and um, uh, I can introduce it with uh, therapy strategies for ruptured aortic aneurysms in patients with connective tissue disease. Um, thank you. Dear Alexander, thank you for the invitation to talk about therapy strategies for ruptured descending aortic pathologies in patients with connective tissue diseases. First, I performed a literature research about aortic rupture management in connective tissue disease. I found some case reports, but nothing else. So we have no recommendations for this patient group. So we have to do our own considerations about aortic management in connective tissue disease. Features of syndromic patients are their as in this example, they're young and healthy with relevant life, exp life expectancy. They have often multi-level disease, they suffer from progressive aortic dilatation of not treated segments and landing zones, and they have a tendency of uh, kinking and elongation, and they have a high aortic wall vulnerability prone for retrograde and anterograde dissection, as in this example. So we have a complex, fragile disease in young and fit patients and they need a durable, complication-free repair. I think this is a hostile environment for endovascular repair. But what is the evidence of open and endovascular repair? For open repair in thoracoabdominal aortic disease and for endo repair, I found a systematic review from the Journal of Vascular Surgery from 2018. In open repair, we have an acceptable operative mortality and morbidity with low re-intervention rates and uh, high survival rates in the, in, in the long term. But what is the evidence for TVAR in connective tissue disease? We have also acceptable perioperative mortality and morbidity rates comparable to open repair. But we have excessive rates of early and late treatment failures and, and endograft related complications. So I believe in general open repair is still the treatment of choice in fit and elective connective tissue disease patients. As here in this guy with a 40, in this 47 year old guy with type 2 repair, open repair two years after complicated endovascular repair complicated with two type 3 endo leaks and one ren renal artery occlusion. But endovascular repair has advantages in patients, may, may have advantages in patients unfit for open repair, redo surgery, and there's a life-saving options in aortic emergency with exsanguination and male perf malperfusion. As in this 20-year-old young lady, with acute type B dissection one day after birth, she had all signs of a complicated type B aortic dissection with contained thoracic rupture, visceral and peripheral ischemia. 
we, we performed for therapy, we performed a membrane rupture and sealing by T-bar, an uncovered petticoat and endovascular neobifurcation for male perfusion and peripheral ischemia. She's still under, stable and under surveillance. So we have to balance out the advantages and disadvantages of open repair um, and endovascular repair, but when, what to do in connective tissue disease. I think it's easier to focus on clear situations. In stable, fit patients with limited morphology, we would use open repair for quick hemorrhage with quick hemorrhage control, 100% success rate, lower incidence of retrograde dissection and better long-term results. In complex morphologies, unsuitable for endo endovascular repair, we would, we would definitely use over open repair due to the lack of alternative. In complex morphology with expected long EVAR intervention times and in unstable patients, we would also use open repair due to the time advantage. In patients unfit for repair, endo is the treatment of choice due to, due to the lack of alternative. In suitable morphology and unstable, especially uh, infrarenal or th thoracic rupture, endo may have a time advantage <coughs> and is less uh, invasive. In morphology with high surgical risk and or expected longer operation times as rupture T-bed, T-bed or thoracic or thoracoabdominal redo operations, endo may have a time advantage and is less invasive. So, with this, you can cover 90% of the cases. Now to the technical considerations to note in open repair in connective tissue disease. Avoid repeated clamping, lower blood, lower blood pressure before clamping and force suture lines to avoid retrograde dissection and as in this example. Minimize repair to segments really needed for rupture exclusion or to, to one cavity to spare time, trauma, and to, to reduce the risk of spinal cord ischemia. In partial aortic replacement, create landing zones up, um, of more than 5 cm for potential later endovascular repair. Prepare machine perfusion parallel to aortic access to spare operation time and start distal machine perfusion duly before uh, exposure of the aneurysm to reduce ischemia time in case of emergency clamping. Now to technical considerations in endovascular repair of connective tissue disease patients. The dilemma of endovascular repair and ruptured CTD is the floppy aorta. For safe sealing, you need a relevant oversizing of more than uh, of 20%, but this has an inherent risk of dissection. To reduce the risk of dissection, use stand crafts with low radial, radial force without bear stands, hooks and barbs. Land in straight aortic segments to reduce the edge forces, forces and use candy plug in ruptured aortic dissections more than a membrane rupture by oversized uh, stand crafts. Use moldering or blocking balloons carefully or better not uh, because of the increased risk of dissection. An ideal indication for endovascular repair in ruptured CTD would be a bridging situation from graft to graft, as in this uh, example. After the successful rupture exclusion, <coughs> perform close surveillance or even planned conversion for, due to the better long-term results. To conclude, rupture in connective tissue disease is a rare condition. <coughs> it's a heterogeneous complex patient cohort, endovascular and open repair are complementary therapy approaches, do not tinker and lose time with uh, fragile, uh, with failure prone procedures and don't forget the main goal in aortic rupture, fast and definitive rupture control. Thank you for attention.
Yeah, so unfortunately, uh, Professor Christian Rebs is not uh, here with us uh, because he maybe is doing a, a repair of a patient with a connective tissue disease, but uh, maybe um, somebody else um, wants to ask the questions or Zoran, should we just move forward with the next talk? Uh, maybe the great experience, I think, in treatment of uh, patients with connective tissue disease has uh, Professor Schmidley. So, Jörg, sorry for interrupting you, but maybe you can give, give some comments on, um, on this talk or, for example, answer on this question. I did not treat the patient with Enlerdanlos endovascular technique in emergency situation. So... My answer should be no. In Marfan, yes, with dissection, but maybe Jörg. Uh, we treated very few patients with dissections or with a rupture in Ailes Danlos. Uh, two were children, and we could not use any endovascular stent grafts because the, the size of the vessels too were small. too small. Mm. Can I ask you something, Jörg, about this uh, type yeah. 4 Illidanus cases? Do you routinely also reinforce them? Because even if you do them very carefully, uh, we've had it indeed in an 18-year-old that we had to redo every single anastomosis almost three times because everything was daring. Just wonder how you deal with these because they're very challenging and very uh, time-consuming. Yeah, you're right. We, we reinforce all anastomosis with a pericardial uh, strip uh, completely surrounding the anastomosis, sometimes inside as well. Okay. So inside and outside, and you use different needles than you normally would do, smaller needles or not? Not, not uh, four O small needle, yeah, but okay. not smaller than that. Maybe I have one question because the professor rep said uh, after putting the stent grafts, he's planning the conversion to open surgery. And what, um, okay, you don't know because you did not put, <laughs> but what should be that time when to decide to move from endovascular conversion to open surgery? When is this time? We can agree, okay, we did, it was a save, life-saving procedure. We saved the patient. Where should we um, convert remove the endovascular stand graft and convert to open surgery. Should we hurry up or we have time if we see during the follow-up that the situation is stable to wait? What should be your opinion? Difficult, difficult question, Zoran. <laughs> uh, we did both and we were wrong. So <laughs> we, we had a patient, he, he only was three uh, months after the procedure, he had the rupture and then a stent graft placed, and then he had a small dissection below, and we thought uh, we will wait, and he, he uh, developed uh, visceral malperfusion uh, and a continuous dissection. That was a terrible case. He almost didn't survive. So actually, if it can be done and the patient is okay, uh, we should do it within three months. We follow them, yeah. We follow them up very closely, Zoran. So, if you have somebody in whom you've put in a stent graft and you're suspecting that they are genetically affected, sometimes it's not even known, or you think they have something but uh, you can't really identify it, we actually follow them up before they leave the hospital and already a month later to see if there's any rapid changes, then you actually convert them. I asked that because we had two sisters uh, who had uh, two who had the B dissection. And we put two stents grafts, one we replaced and she passed away and the second still have and we are making routinely control and they are both genetically confirmed that they have a Marfan syndrome. So, so decision is, uh, so. There's, okay. one question. There's one more question from the audience. Do you always use a cardiopulmonary bypass? Yeah. In in thoracoabdominal, except uh, in type four, we do we use cardiopulmonary bypass. Type two, two, type one to three, yeah. Okay, thanks. So, thank you, Jörg, for giving us the answers from experience and for knowledge. Thank you, thank you, Jörg. It was 
excellent talk. And uh, my dear participants and uh, dear panelists, we are coming to the end of the second day officially. And um, I must tell you that we have one talk from uh, vascular surgeon from the Department of Thoracic, Cardiothoracic and Vascular Surgery, University Medical Center, Göttingen, Germany, Florian Elger. Hello, Florian. Hello. It is, um, he's going to talk about retrograde inner branch, TIVR, a new option for the aortic arch, sponsored by Terumo. So please, um, Florian, pre-recorded floor is yours. And design very much for letting me speak on this occasion. I would like to introduce to you a new stent design for TIVA procedures, which from my point of view has great potential to simplify procedures in the distal aortic arch and perhaps even in the proximal aortic arch, especially in emergency or urgent cases. My name is Florian Elger and I'm reporting from University Medical Center Göttingen. As you are well aware, the mortality from acute aortic rupture of the descending aorta remains high. By using endovascular techniques, however, it was possible to achieve a significant reduction in mortality compared to open surgical treatments during the last decades. If one compares today's data with those of the early 80s, where some authors describe mortality rates of 80 to 100 percent, the medical progress becomes evident. During the last years, problems such as spinal ischemia, long ventilation times and kidney failure could be reduced, but still play a role. In our department, we treat the entire aorta. As you all know, it is sometimes challenging to create a proper landing zone in zone 1 and 2 of the aorta for further endovascular treatment. Particularly in the case of ruptured pathologies in zone 2, for example penetrating aortic ulcers, in the area where the ductus brutali runs into the aorta, or a rupture in the proximal descending aorta, these areas must also be properly covered. Time is a limiting factor in these situations. We have extensive experience in the various debranching procedures and perform all types of cervical debranchings. Together with our cardiac surgeons, we also carry out the corresponding thoracic debranchings in complex cases. In recent years, we have performed various options of endovascular and combined therapy methods in the aortic arch in a number of plant cases with very good and promising results. Among those are scallop devices, fenestrator devices and combinations of fenestrations and scallops. These procedures were combined with debranching procedures were needed. We felt there is a need for a device that doesn't have a need for a retrograde cannulation or an obligatory debranching when you want to preserve the left subclavian artery and that might have a future as a semi-custom or off-the-shelf device and might be applicable in emergency cases. So we asked the Terumi team if it might be an option to rotate the branch module of the Bolton double branch graft by 180 degrees. And if you just have finished your driving lessons, you will probably not start with a brand new sports car so we asked for a single retrograde branch device and not for a double one. The patient we treated with this device was a 62-year-old male patient who strictly denied open surgery. This patient had a conservative treated type B dissection in 2013. We now saw a fast progression of a post-dissection aneurysm on the proximal descending aorta with a maximum diameter of 63 millimeters. This patient underwent open aortic surgery in his youth in the former GDR due to aortic coarctation. There was no old documentation for this procedure available. He also suffered from a severe psoriasis treated with antibodies and steroids, an associated rheumatic disease, hypertension and obesity. Here are the preoperative CT scans. Here is the device scheme. As you can see, there is a proximal ceiling zone of 20 mm, followed by a broad exit area for the bridging stand that allows more flexibility compared to a fenestration. 
There is a long inner branch that guarantees a stable fixation of Tiva and bridging stand. The inner branch in our case had a diameter of 12 mm because the left subclavian artery had a proximal diameter of 12 mm and a distal one of 9 to 10 mm. The procedure was done without any complications. We do all the aortic procedures percutaneously when feasible, also in this case. Before positioning the stent graft, we check the correct position in the true lumen of the dissected aorta and afterwards mark the branches of the aortic arch. The stent graft was deployed under rapid pacing for maximum precision and unfolded in the correct position. The cannulation of the inner branch took only a few seconds. After checking the position of the left vertebral artery, we positioned a Guru VBX 11 by 79 as bridging stand. The bridging stand was flat in its proximal portion. Afterwards, we did a kissing balloon maneuver in the curvature of the aortic arch that led to a much better alignment of the TIVA. The proximal ceiling in the air order was not ballooned. I want to show the profile of the stand graft in the vertex of the air order where we did the kissing balloon. As you can see, the lumen of the air order is preserved. The branch takes about 40% of the lumen. The final angiogram showed a good result without endoleaks, stenosis or dissections. The retrograde inner branch design didn't cause relevant limitations concerning the arterial flow. The patient recovered quickly after the procedure and we didn't see any neurological problems. Also the post-operative CT scans showed a very good result with preserved left subclavian artery and complete occlusion of the aneurysm. The patient was discharged in very good condition six days after surgery. In our opinion, the concept of a retrograde inner branch TIVA is very promising. Our case was of course a plant custom-made case, but I think that an adoption of this design as semi-custom or even off the shelf would be very interesting for some users, for treatment of urgent or emergency cases. In our case, it allowed transfemoral cannulation and standing of the left subclavian artery in a short amount of time. Time-consuming debranching or retrograde cannulation of supraortic vessels was not necessary. The inner branch offers a large diameter, high stability for the bridging stand, and due to the design of the outlet allows easy cannulation of the target vessel and might forgive minor errors when deploying the TIVA. The design would open a number of possibilities in emergency situations when treating the aortic arch and could possibly be extended by a second branch. It could also be used in proximal aortic positions in combination with debranching if open treatment with extracorporeal circulation is not appropriate. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Florian. Thank you, Florian. Really interesting uh, device. Um, uh, one question uh, is there um, what's the limitation um, or what's the distance from the um, uh, start of the um, orifice for the left uh, subclavian artery to the maybe common carotid artery, which um, you need. Is there any limitations concerning that? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Bolton says it's 20 millimeters. Uh, so we had this kind of um, design on our um, uh, TIVA. But I think a um, possible option um, to decrease the landing zone might be. Um, uh, the window to be positioned a little bit um, downwards so that you have kind of channel where you can cannulate uh, the target vessel. Interesting. And um, so it, it, there is quite a new device. I think there are no numbers uh, how many patients are, are you can fit uh, or are suitable for this device or do you have those? No, we don't have any numbers in this respect. Okay. Um, we treat quite a lot of uh, acute cases like acute and complicated type B dissections and we also have a number of patients um, with complicated type A uh, conditions and so we were looking for a graft uh, with some design uh, similar to this and uh, as you know in Europe uh, the Gore TBE is still not available and other design types like the Ankura with retrograde cannulation or retrograde um, puncture of the graft material um, also have or always have some um, limitations. So um, I thought this design was pretty nice um, because it's uh, based on a, a very um, yeah established design like uh, as a Bolton NBS. Uh, 
Very interesting. There was one question from the audience if you um, used uh, spinal cord drainage in this uh, special case. So we have a lethal guard in our department, but for this case, we didn't use it. Okay. Is, um, there, is there any recommendations uh, at, in, in which cases you, or what's your protocol of, of um, using spinal cord drainage? Do you use it in, um, by, by, by certain means or in, in, in every case? So we use spinal cord drainage if we uh, treat uh, large distances for more over than more than uh, 25 centimeters, uh, or if we do extensive um, combinations uh, with uh, TIA combis. Um, but during the last years, we reduced um, the usage of spinal cord drainage uh, because we do a lot of multi-step procedures and. Uh, so sometimes you have also a complication during uh, spinal cord drainage. Um, so it's only for uh, selective cases. Thank you. Um, I think there was uh, one participant who asked if you can share the material. Maybe you can answer this in the chat uh, later on. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. And if I'm not wrong, you presented a case for uh, chronic dissection or acute dissection? No, this one was uh, chronic dissection. Uh, okay. So the patient um, suffered from a tibial section in 2013, which was conservative treated. But now he developed a um, post-dissection aneurysm, which was um, progressing quite fast during the last year. There is also a question, when, uh, will you, uh, is, uh, in acute dissection, using double balloon technique, are you not afraid to mold the graft and cause retrograde dissection? Uh, sure. Do you see any uh, place for um, this uh, device in uh, acute settings? Uh, as I told in my presentation, we didn't balloon the proximal area of stent graft. Mm -hmm. And in acute dissections, we do not do any ballooning. Um, we do it in the um, distal areas. We do a lot of stabilized techniques in our clinic and petticoat techniques. Mm -hmm. um, but we don't balloon the pro proximal areas of the stent grafts. So I think this was a there was a question: Is it a is this a CMD device at the moment? Right. At the moment, it's a CMD device. Yes. Okay. And um, so, how long does it take to for for planning and um, getting actually the graft uh, into the patient? Uh, it took about four weeks. Four weeks. Yeah. So, so and by definition, we don't have an acute uh, <laughs> dissection anymore. So I think this question. Um, yeah. It's solved, um, but but it's really interesting if the um, if they're planning to 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 um, go into the market as an off-the-shelf device. I think that would maybe make uh, some cases much more reasonable. Definitely. And uh, but there is also the uh, often the um, question about costs, and um, so um, do you um, is it um, at the moment cost-effective or um, uh, I think uh, in Germany, we are, I worked there before, we always have the pressure of our hospitals. Um, uh, sometimes uh, the, the uh, controller comes to you and says, oh, two operations must, must be better. You can uh, get two DRGs when uh, uh, operating on a patient with a carotid subclavian bypass and get him in a couple of weeks uh, later. I think as a, a medical doctor and uh, Patient advocate, it uh, should be much better to, to do this all in one case, or am I wrong? No, the DRG, uh, DRG system is quite complicated in this respect, but um, in our department, we have something that is called Zusatzentgelt. Uh, I don't know the English translation, so you get some additional uh, money for um, extra procedures, and we have a uh, Zusatzentgelt for the single fenestrated um, thoracic grafts. And so in this case, it was cost effective, um, but I think uh, many departments might have the problem that it isn't cost effective. So I think there are no more questions from the audience or um, has anybody else out there another questions for one of the previous um, speakers or at the, to the panel or to Dr. Elga. Otherwise, um, I think we have to thank everybody 
Well, it was yeah. a, a great day again. Um, we learned a lot um, about um, open surgery, um, uh, about the um, evidence uh, of ruptured aortic aneurysms, about um, ethical uh, and moral aspects. This was a really, really interesting talk. Um, as well as um, how, how we do report cases and why not, and um, uh, when uh, and how to treat uh, genetic patients and um, what to do with um, auto in our fistula. So a uh, very uh, broad uh, spectrum and um, looking forward to next week's uh, talk. Um, we will have, uh, the, we will see us again next Wednesday evening or daytime or morning or night, uh, wherever on the world. And um, I give the word to um, Zoran. So dear panelists, dear, okay, sorry, no, dear attendees, you are in the main focus of our course, dear panelists and dear all company, uh, Florian, you were with us. That was once again, the situation where we had a great time when we show that discussing about one topic, management of aortic rupture is a worth. And we saw the diagnostic, we saw the open surgery and the next uh, Wednesday at five o'clock Central European time, we are going to start with endovascular. So that means I really love this. And uh, I, we hope that you have all these presentations on YouTube and welcome again and have a good night, good uh, evening or good morning, depends where you are coming from. Thank you very much and see you soon. Thanks.